Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories number 19 for mid-April 2023. John Carbutt, Forgotten Philadelphia Photography Pioneer. Welcome to the 19th episode of Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories, an historic and active cemetery in Bala Kinwood, Pennsylvania. I am Joe Lex, a retired professor of emergency medicine at Temple University, volunteer tour guide, and volunteer podcaster for both cemeteries. Laurel Hill West opened in 1869 across the river from its sister cemetery, Laurel Hill East in Philadelphia. It's more than twice as big as Laurel Hill East. It has a totally different feel and a strikingly different population. And like Laurel Hill East, it's open 365 days a year, now from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. There's plenty of parking at the business office just off Belmont Avenue or at the conservatory and bell tower. If you enter on Belmont, follow the road past the second gate with the white line in the middle. Another possibility, you can just duck in while you're walking the Kinwood Trail. Your best bet for public transportation, take the R6 to Maniunk or a bus to the Wissahickon Transportation Center on Ridge Avenue, and then cross the Pencoid Pedestrian Bridge, walk up Riders Ferry Road to the entrance across from the Pet Cemetery, the Laurels. This 19th episode of Biographical Bites from Bala is for mid-April 2023. It was scheduled to be about pioneering dry goods merchants, Strawbridge and Clothier. But then I found out that Margaret Strawbridge Butterworth is about to release a family history in May. So I postponed the podcast until I can read what she has to say. Instead, I'm going to tell you about John Carbutt, who was born in England and immigrated to Chicago, where he became a professional photographer. After he moved to Philadelphia, he spent many years improving the photographic process by simplifying the developing process, producing the first dry plates sold in America, pioneering the printing of halftones in magazines, and manufacturing the first dry x-ray plates in the country from his workshop at Wayne Junction in Mount Airy. Yet despite his innovations, he is rarely remembered today, and he rests in an unmarked grave at Laurel Hill West. Today, you will hear more about Philadelphia's role in the development of photography when I tell you about John Carbutt, forgotten Philadelphia photography pioneer. Back in December of 2021, All Bones Considered number 33 was called Smile for the Birdie, Philadelphia's Photography Pioneers. I talked about Robert Cornelius, Laurel Hill East Section J, who in 1839 made the first known self-portrait, in other words, the first selfie with his homemade daguerreotype. I talked about Frederick Goodekunst, Laurel Hill East Section X, who was the Dean of American Portrait Photographers in the late 19th century. I discussed Matthew Carey Lee, Laurel Hill East Section S, whose pioneering work in photochemistry led to the invention of Carey Lee Silver, which is an essential part of color photography even today. 
And I told you about Coleman Sellers II, Laurel Hill West, Lensdown section, whose 1861 kinematoscope is recognized as the first motion picture, 11 years before the pioneering multi-camera work of Edward James Meebridge, and 26 years before the groundbreaking work of Thomas Edison. I missed somebody important in that podcast. Today, it is his turn. The term photograph, or drawing with light, was introduced in 1839. It's the same year that Daguerre introduced daguerreotypes. As photography methods improved, daguerreotype rapidly fell out of favor. It did not lend itself to easy duplication. It was fragile and had to be kept under glass in a bulky case or frame, and it was expensive. By the 1856 annual exhibition of the Photographic Society of London, there were 606 images on display. Only three were daguerreotypes. In America, the process survived a bit longer. But by 1864, the profession daguerreotypist no longer appeared in the business directories of several U.S. cities. Improvements in equipment and chemistry had led to the calotype negative, which could be used to make gelatin silver prints or salted paper prints. But the calotype method used fibrous paper, which led to irregular prints. The next step was to figure out how to get silver salts to adhere to the smooth surface of glass. Early experiments testing potential sticky substances even involved the use of the gluey slime that's exuded by snails. There was some success using egg whites when albumin plates were introduced in 1847. One advantage was that albumin plates could be prepared months in advance. There was an albuminizing plant in Dresden, Germany that used girls to separate the egg whites from the yolks Roughly 60,000 eggs daily. But albumin plates had low light sensitivity, and they required exposure times as long as three hours. The next attempt was with collodion, a volatile, viscous, highly flammable, highly toxic solution of nitrocellulose in alcohol and ether. Cellulose itself is benign. It's an important structural component of the cell walls of green plants. In fact, cellulose is the most abundant organic polymer on Earth. The cellulose content of cotton fiber is 90%. That of wood is 40 to 50%. That of dried hemp is approximately 57%. Nitrocellulose, also known as cellulose nitrate, flash paper, flash cotton, gun cotton, peroxylin, flash string. It's a highly flammable compound formed by exposing cellulose to a mixture of nitric acid and sulfuric acid. One of its first major uses was gun cotton, a replacement for gunpowder as a propellant in firearms. It had been discovered in 1846 when Christian Friedrich Schoenbein, a German-Swiss chemist, was working in the kitchen of his home in Basel. He spilled a mixture of nitric acid and sulfuric acid on the kitchen table, and he wiped it up with the nearest cloth, a cotton apron, which he hung on the stove door to dry. As soon as it was dry, there was a flash, and the apron ignited. There are two types of collodion, flexible and non-flexible. The flexible type was once used either as a surgical dressing or to hold dressings in place. When I was a medic with a mechanized infantry unit in Vietnam 55 years ago, we kept a bottle of collodion in the Big Angel. That was our armored personnel carrier battalion aid station. We used it to cover and protect minor lacerations, minor wounds. When collodion is painted on the skin, it dries to form a flexible nitrocellulose film, which is initially colorless, but it darkens over time. Non-flexible collodion is sometimes used in theatrical makeup. In 1851, English sculptor Frederick Scott Archer 
developed a method of sensitizing glass plates with silver salts using collodion. He exposed the wet plate in the camera, then developed it in a dark room using pyrogallic acid. He fixed it in hypo, sodium thiosulfate, then washed and dried it. All of these operations had to be done before the collodion dried up and became impervious to processing solutions. This meant the photographer could not be too far from the darkroom. Exposure time was anywhere from 15 to 60 seconds, which meant that a tripod was preferred over handheld. The ambrotype was introduced in the 1850s. It received its name from Philadelphian Marcus Aurelius Root, who was interred at Woodland Cemetery. One side of a clean glass plate was coated with a thin layer of iodized collodion, then dipped in a silver nitrate solution. While still wet, the plate was exposed in the camera from 5 to 60 seconds or more, depending on the brightness of the light, the speed of the camera lens. The plate was then developed and fixed. The resulting negative, when viewed by reflected light against a black background, appears to be a positive image. The clear areas look black, and the exposed opaque areas appear relatively light. By the 1860s, the amber type was being superseded by the tin type, also known as a melanotype or a ferrotype. A tin type is made by creating a direct positive on a thin sheet of metal which has been coated with a dark lacquer or enamel before being used as the support for the photographic emulsion. Since the final product is on a metal base, it is far sturdier than a daguerreotype or ambrotype and can more easily and safely be shipped. Almost all 19th century photographs were printed by contact from a negative, so they were the exact size of the negative. Early attempts at enlargement were slow and tedious until more sensitive printing paper came along a few decades later. In addition to photographic innovators like Cornelius, Gutekunst, Lee, and Sellers, Philadelphia's reputation as the Center for American Photography was cemented with the publication of a monthly magazine called The Philadelphia Photographer. Beginning in January 1864 and lasting for nearly 40 years, Edward Livingston Wilson, 1838 to 1903. He's buried in Vineland, New Jersey. Published this most influential photography journal in the United States. It was later renamed Wilson's Photographic Magazine. Wilson had begun his career in photography as a cashier and a bookkeeper for Frederick Gutekunst. Now, unlike other journals of the day, which were filled with reproductive wood engravings, Wilson understood that actual photographs needed to be seen for his audience to appreciate this new art form. And so, quote, it was determined that a photographic study should accompany each number, end quote. These were not lithographs. These were not halftones. These were actual photographs that were pasted into each issue of the magazine. From 1864 to 1901, when photographs were replaced by halftones, Wilson published 540 prints by 280 photographers from 142 cities in 16 countries. Within the United States alone, he received negatives from photographers in 33 different states, remarkable considering there were only 36 states in 1864, and there were 44 by 1890. One of Wilson's most frequent contributors and collaborators, soon to be his close friend, was John Carbutt. Born in Sheffield, England on 2 December 1832 to Robert Carbutt, a Mason, and his wife Anne, John Carbutt immigrated to Toronto, Canada as a young man about 1853. Much of his early life is unknown. When Carbutt's friends, Louis Levy and Samuel Sartain, wrote a tribute to him in 1905 for the Journal of the Franklin Institute, they said that he had been, quote, the official photographer for the Canadian Pacific Railroad during the building of that road. 
Except that the Canadian Pacific was not built until the 1880s, long after Carbot left commercial photography and was into manufacturing. The only major railroad construction in Canada during the 1850s was for the Grand Trunk Railway, which initially ran from Portland, Maine to Montreal and eventually continued to Chicago. It was apparently during this time in the field for the railroad company that Carbutt came up with his portable dark room, actually a dark tent. Sometime in the late 1850s, John Carbutt worked in a photographic gallery in Indiana before he returned to England. In Sheffield, he was listed as a photographic artist in the Sheffield trade directories of 1861 and 62. But in 1961, he came back to the States. This time, he settled in Chicago. He thought that he could make a living there as a photographer. He had a studio at 131 Lake Street. And he had developed his own gold-toning bath for albumin prints, a combination of calcium, sodium, and gold. This helped improve the color of the prints. Photographic historians can trace Carbot's career through Wilson's The Philadelphia Photographer. In September 1864, the magazine noted that Carbot had been elected first vice president and corresponding secretary of the Northwestern Photographic Society. Wilson also noted that he'd received some fine stereo views from Carbot, including The Falls of Minnehaha and Kinnikinnick. Carbot also shared the idea for his developing tent, as well as allowing Wilson to print the instructions for constructing Carbot's portable developing box, which he sold commercially for $35. That's about $650 today. This box weighed 18 to 20 pounds. It took only a few minutes to set up, and it protected the developer from the fumes of the collodion, which, because of the ether and the ethanol, have anesthetic properties. People working with collodium in an unprotected area over a long period would first develop nose and throat irritation, was followed by dizziness, drowsiness, and continued exposure could lead to coma, respiratory failure, and death. Another of Carbot's Chicago innovations was a solar camera, at that time the only known means to make prints larger than the negative itself. Other United States photographers may have become aware of Carbutt for the first time with the February 1865 edition of the Philadelphia Photographer, which chose for its photographic insert Carbutt's albumen print of the Illinois landmark Starved Rock. Carbutt had printed 700 copies for Wilson to use in the magazine. Carbutt visited Philadelphia in early 1865. He met with fellow photography pioneer Coleman Sellers. After President Lincoln's assassination, Carbutt arranged to take stereo views of the interior of Lincoln's home, but he never photographed the great man himself. In October 1865, just a few months after the Civil War ended, Carbutt was hired by the Northwestern Union Packet Company's fleet of five steamships which carried freight and passengers on a daily run from Illinois to St. Paul on the upper Mississippi River. He made a series of stereo views, which he sold as a volume called Beauties of the Upper Mississippi. He also invented a method of making a portrait on a watch dial by removing the dial from the watch, coating it with albumin, and then making it sensitive to light. Along the way, John married Mary Elizabeth Ackerman, whom everyone called Molly. They had two sons and two daughters who lived to adulthood. Prior to 1866, Carbot had never been west of the Mississippi River. But the Union Pacific Railroad, founded in 1862, hired him in 1866 to take photos to show their investors about the progress they had made. The railroad initially planned to have 247 miles of track by the end of 1867, but they were a year ahead of their schedule. Track was being laid at the rate of two miles per day, mostly by Irish immigrants, who used 2,640 ties per mile, one every two feet, mostly cedar, oak, and walnut. 
To celebrate this success, Union Pacific invited 200 influential guests with their wives and daughters on a grand excursion to a point halfway between Chicago and the Rocky Mountains. Carbutt was the official photographer for this excursion into the newly tamed western wilderness. He took 36 stereo views, which are highly prized by collectors today. But by the time the two ends of the Union Pacific Railroad met at Promontory Point, Utah in 1869, Carbutt was not one of those three official photographers. When he got back to Chicago in 1868, he started work on an amazing work called Biographical Sketches of the Leading Men of Chicago, photographically illustrated by Jay Carbutt. Remember, at this time, it was impossible to reproduce photographs on the printed page. Each portrait had to be produced in quantity and then carefully glued into the space provided for it in each of the 450 copies of this 670-page book, about 110 well-known Chicagoans. So let's see, that's 110 people, 450 copies of the book. That is just a little short of 50,000 albumen portraits. And unfortunately, this magnificent book, many copies were lost in the Great Chicago Fire three years later. In August of 1869, Carbett again got together with the Philadelphia photography community when he was invited by Professor Henry Morton of the Franklin Institute to join the expedition to Iowa to photograph a total eclipse of the sun. There was a private car provided by the Pennsylvania Railroad Company that picked him up when the train passed through Chicago. When he got back from Iowa, he was off again to England, this time to acquire the rights to the Woodbury printing process, which promised an end to the labor-intensive lithographic process or the need to glue photos one at a time into publications. Carbett worked on perfecting the Woodbury procedure. When he showed his prints to the Photographic Society of Chicago, they were declared the most beautiful pictures ever displayed at the Society. In the January 1870 issue of the Philadelphia Photographer, the first Woodbury type appeared in the United States, but the negative had been provided by Woodbury. The thousands of prints needed were produced by one man in less than a week from only one exposure of the negative. In late 1870, Carbett sold his Chicago studio and moved with wife and children to Philadelphia. A year later, The Great Chicago Fire destroyed more than 17,000 buildings, including all the photography studios on Lake Street. The estimated loss to Chicago photographers was more than a quarter million dollars. John Carbutt set up shop in Philadelphia for the American Photo Relief Company. They were at 1002 Arch Street. This was primarily for the purpose of making Woodbury process prints for magazines, advertisements for Baldwin Locomotive Works, portrait illustrations, including 5,000 copies of a portrait of publisher George W. Childs, who's interred at Laurel Hill East in Section K. Reproducing photographs in a magazine was now a reality, but it was a complex, expensive process prone to easy errors. And then Philadelphia summers threw a monkey wrench into Carbot's plans. He had to make many modifications in order to water cool the Woodbury press and molds so the gelatin ink would set properly. Other companies observed. They learned from his errors, they managed to undercut him, and they developed simpler processes than that of Woodbury. Now, despite joining the Franklin Institute in 1873 and winning a silver medal from them the next year, he still didn't make a profit with this process. In the fall of 1874, he moved to smaller quarters, this time at 624 North 24th Street. In July 1875, Carbett advertised commercial dry plates in the Philadelphia Photographer. 8x10s were $7 a dozen, 17 by 20 plates were $25 a dozen. They apparently weren't as fast as he advertised, and they came off the market after just a few months.
In April 1876, John Carbot was hired by the Philadelphia Centennial's Director General to be Superintendent of Photographic Hall during the Centennial Exposition. This photographic exhibit was a huge hit. But by 1878, Carbot had to downsize again, this time at 54 North 9th Street. He was listed in the city directory as a printer and photolithographer. He was struggling, but he was not ready to give up. The turning point in his life came in 1879. Carbot was 47 years old. His years of experimenting with dry plates, his extensive experience in working with gelatin, resulted in his introduction of the first successful dry plates in America. Other dry plates had been produced, but they required an exposure time of three minutes, six to ten times longer than wet collodion. Once again, he advertised his new gelatin bromide dry plates in the Philadelphia Photographer. This time they were indeed rapid plates. Ten by eight inch plates were four and a half dollars a dozen. Five by four plates were a dollar ten per dozen. This seemed to be the real thing. He had a difficult time keeping up with the orders. One satisfied user wrote, I have just returned from a trip 100 miles west on railroad and 125 miles south with team. I took along 24 plates and exposed them. You may be pleased to hear the result. 17 first-class negatives, 6 that needed redeveloping, being overexposed, and one failure, owing to the camera being out of focus. F. J. Haynes, a contract photographer for the Northern Pacific Railroad, became famous for his work as the official photographer of Yellowstone National Park. The Montana Historical Society is a repository for thousands of his original glass plate negatives. Many of them are carbut dry plates. William Henry Jackson, official photographer for the U.S. Geological Survey, whose photographs persuaded Congress to establish Yellowstone National Park in 1872, was a huge fan. What can you supply us the plates at by the 100 or 500 at a time, cash with order? I would prefer them 8 by 10 size so as to cut them as needed. In a national competition, Carbot's plates were voted the best available. While the typical photographer once had to be comfortable with using nitrate of silver, distilled water, ether, alcohol, nitrocellulose, iodides, bromides, eggs, and glass, now all they needed was Carbot's dry plates. Carbot's next successful invention was the photographic lantern, which he called Multum in Parvo, much in little. This kerosene-driven 9-inch square by 14-inch high lantern provided three types of light for the darkroom worker. A non-actinic light for the coating, manipulation, and development of the plates, a white diffused light to examine the condition of the developed plate, and a clear bright light for the printing of positives. The advertisements crowed this indispensable gadget was six dollars ready to ship. Now, instead of downsizing, Carbot needed more space. There was a move to 601 and 603 Market Street in May 1882. The next year, he was moving up again, 628 and 630 Chestnut Street. One of John's customers who contributed to this growth was another Englishman, Edward Muybridge, who used Carbot plates from 1883 to 1885 at the University of Pennsylvania when he was doing his famous series on animal locomotion. So all of those plates that you've seen of animals in motion from the UPenn and Muay Bridge use Carbot's plates. On 20 April 1884, John Carbot purchased a 201 foot by 215 foot at 124 West Berkeley in Wayne Junction and he opened the Keystone Dry Plate Works. The main building, it's still there, has two stories and a basement with about 18,000 square feet of floor space. John and Molly moved not far from his new factory 
to 6118 McCallum Street. It's just a block or so from the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion. He was out of the business of being a photographer, and he was into the business of photographic supplies and innovations. In 1886, he commercially introduced the first orthochromatic dry plates in America. Orthochromatic photography refers to a photographic emulsion that is sensitive to only blue and green light and thus can be processed with a red safe light. The increased blue sensitivity causes blue objects to appear lighter and red ones darker. Fifteen years later, he introduced polychromatic plates, which had improvement over his original orthochromatic plates. In 1888, he added Thomas Edison's electric lights to his factory, and production could now go on 24 hours daily. His next step was to find something to replace glass as the basis for photos. A celluloid, not to be confused with cellulose, had been introduced in 1869 by the Hyatt brothers of Newark, New Jersey. But Carbot rejected their first samples because of an imperfect finish. Eventually, they got it done to Carbot's satisfaction in uniform thickness and finish, and he was able to slice thin sheets, one one one-hundredth of an inch, from a block of compressed celluloid. After the chemical process, these were just as good as glass, if not better. Now, 24 5 by 8 flexible films weighed only half a pound, compared to 7 pounds for a similar quantity of glass dry plates. Plus, the celluloid's thinness allowed negatives to be printed from either side. In early 1889, he supplied photographic emulsion-coated celluloid to Thomas Edison, who used it for his early experiments in making motion pictures, although Edison later switched to George Eastman's film. In 1890, things were running smoothly, so John Carbot took Molly and the kids on a tour of England and Europe, and when he returned, his employees gave him a large floral arrangement in appreciation of the way he ran the company. He, in turn, gave all his employees a week's salary bonus as thanks for running the business so well while he was away. His next venture was to sell compact cameras at 39 South 10th Street. The camera was called a Genie Hen camera. It held 12 glass plates or 24 celluloid ones in a magazine, which had been invented by photographer William E. Schneider. Considering the cheapness and the simplicity of this equipment, these so-called snapshots were unusually clear, well-defined, and full of detail. Although the term snapshot had first been used in 1860, implying pictures in a snap, it had been more a prediction than a reality. The snapshot concept was further made available to the public at large by Eastman Kodak, which introduced the Brownie box camera in 1900. Kodak encouraged families to use the Brownie to capture moments in time and to shoot photos without being concerned about producing perfect images. Kodak advertising urged consumers to celebrate the moments of your life and find a Kodak moment. Carbot spread further word of his works when he exhibited at the 1892-93 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. By now, he had developed non-halation plates that did not require chlorine or bromine. Upon request, he created dry plates two feet by three feet in size. He condensed the various liquids needed to develop plates and film into small tablets, which could be reconstituted with distilled water, 75 cents per package, for enough tablets to develop 8 to 12 4 by 5 plates. Carbot's world changed again when German scientist William Rentgen announced in December 1895 that he had photographed the bones of an animal through its skin. Carbutt, now 63 years old, immediately sensed these so-called x-rays were a new use for his dry plates. Rentgen's current method took more than an hour. Carbutt at once set to work to create a plate sensitive to x-rays, just as he had already developed plates that were extra sensitive to different colors. 
In less than two months, using borrowed equipment from Arthur Willis Goodspeed, assistant professor of physics at the University of Pennsylvania, he had reduced exposure time from one hour down to 20 minutes. The first presentation about medical x-rays to a medical audience in the United States was made by Henry Cattell to the Pathological Society of Philadelphia using carbut plates. Cattell is interred at Laurel Hill West in the summit section. Carbutt followed through, and by February 1896, he was marketing his product, his dry plates, under the brand name Rentkin X-ray Plates. They were the first of their kind in the world. And by April, Carbutt and Goodspeed could obtain an X-ray of a living hand in one minute. Within months, they had exposure times down to somewhere between 5 and 30 seconds. And with Professor Goodspeed, his patient, lying on a Carbot plate, Carbot and Goodspeed created a series of radiographs to serve as normals. Each exposure for a full body took about 45 minutes. They next made a life-size x-ray of a four-day-old infant that caused a sensation. It required a two-and-a-half-minute exposure. E. and H. T. Anthony and company reproduced this x-ray on a fold-out page inserted in their July 1896 issue of Anthony's Photographic Bulletin. Obviously, Carbutt, Rentkin, Goodspeed, and other pioneers of radiography were unaware of the damage being done by prolonged x-ray exposures. Carbutt stayed busy with his earlier products also, introducing even cheaper plates to meet competition. He set up a radiography suite at his Wayne Junction factory where local physicians would bring their patients to locate bullets or other metallic material or examine bones under fluoroscopy. He even used it to take an x-ray of a mummy's hand that he borrowed from the Penn Museum. But after doing his work with x-rays, Carbett developed a large and mysterious tumor on his neck. Repeated trips to doctors, both here and abroad, during the last four years of his life failed to bring any resolution to this painful mass, which was never properly identified. Early in 1904, after a severe illness lasting six weeks, Carbett spent a short holiday in Jamaica, and he returned, quote, completely restored to his usual health and vigor, end quote. But his health continued to deteriorate. He died 26 July 1905. He was 73 years old. His death certificate gives cause of death as Bright's disease or interstitial nephritis. Almost until the hour of his death, he was in the lab working on improvements for his many discoveries and inventions. John Carbutt Jr., who had been born in 1869, took over the business, while John Sr. was interred in the Moreland section of Laurel Hill West. There is no grave marker for this Philadelphia pioneer of photography and radiography. In the rather comprehensive book, The History of Photography, he's not even mentioned. But the next time you dig out your family's old 35mm slides, you will know that John Carbot is the man who decided they would be that size. No. 
The May edition of All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories, is about namesakes for colleges and universities. Everyone knows about the Horton School at the University of Pennsylvania, but, but not many people can tell you about its founder, Joseph Horton. Charles McAllister was a successful Philadelphia businessman and a banker who built the estate Glengarry on the edge of Bucks County on the shore of Delaware River. It's now Glen Ford. He donated property for the building of McAllister College at St. Paul, Minnesota. Major Henry Biddle was killed during the Civil War, but his wife made sure he would not be forgotten by donating money to start a college for newly freed enslaved people in North Carolina. And Widener University has been around since 1821, but it only received its current name in 1972, when it was renamed after RMS Titanic survivor Eleanor Lukens Elkins Widener Rice. And if I have time, I'll tell you a little bit about the Clemson connection also. In Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories, episode number 20, in mid-May, you'll hear about Charles Benjamin Dudley, a chemist who evolved into the man who established standards for the railroad industry and was a founder of the American Society for Testing and Materials. It sounds dull. It's not. I remind you that there are self-guided tours available for both cemeteries. For Laurel Hill East, download the app. For Laurel Hill West, you can find it with your podcasts. It's a walkthrough from the Kinwood Trail entrance to the Pencoid exit and another in the opposite direction. If you do the round trip, it's about two hours of stopping at stones, peeping into mausoleums, and hearing about nearly 100 people who helped make Philadelphia what it is today. I am giving four walk-around tours and one virtual tour over the next several weeks at both cemeteries. Sunday, April 30th at 1 p.m., brand new tour. It's called Welcome to Franconia, A Slice of Philadelphia. That's at Laurel Hill West. And unlike most tours at West, this one starts at the funeral home parking lot rather than the conservatory. You will learn about musicians, civil rights leaders, gas, oil, and coal millionaires, architects, a Titanic survivor, and others in this 90-minute, let's call it a low-impact tour. I would say 80 to 90 percent of it is on the paved road. Saturday, May 13th is my 54th anniversary of returning from Vietnam. I usually celebrate this as my second birthday every year. I'm giving a walking, rolling tour at Laurel Hill East starting at 10 a.m. This is designed for visitors in wheelchairs or scooters and does not leave the paved pathway. Wednesday, May 17th at 6.30 p.m., there's a Zoom virtual tour of Laurel Hill West, a sacred spaces and storied places exploration of the famous and the infamous. Saturday, May 20th at 10 a.m., I introduce another new tour, also at Laurel Hill West. This is about sporting people. It's called This Sporting Life. We're going to cover a lot, unlike before when I said it was low impact, we're going to cover a lot of ground on this one. Come prepared to walk, but you will meet members of the baseball, skiing, tennis, hockey, and college football halls of fame, among many others. And finally, on May 27th at 10 a.m., I give a live Laurel Hill West tour that's an introduction to some of our more famous and infamous occupants. That's the sacred spaces and storied places. Tickets for all these events and other tours. I'm not going into it. We're getting into our tour-heavy season. It would take me 10 minutes to tell you all the tours that are coming up. So go check the website, laurelhillphl.com slash events. All Bones Considered and Biographical Bites from Bala are researched, written, narrated, and produced by me, Joe Lex, retired professor of emergency medicine from Temple University, volunteer tour guide, and volunteer podcaster for both cemeteries. Should you wish to contact me, joe at joelex.net is the place to go. The theme song, Names at Peace, is by local artist James Harrow. Maybe I'll see you on a tour. Stay safe, stay well, and the bibliography is up next.
For information on the history of photography, I used a book which is called, amazingly enough, The History of Photography. It's by Beaumont Newhall. It was first published in 1937, but my edition is from 1982, copyrighted by the Museum of Modern Art. And it's just got a lot of good information on starting with the Gadaratype and going through Kalotypes and art photography and just all sorts of history on it. With, of course, lots of really nice pictures in it. For the history of radiology, it's a book called Naked to the Bone, Medical Imaging in the 20th Century. Betty Ann Holtzman Kevles, K-E-V-L-E-S. This is from something called the Sloan Technology Series. Helix Books, Addison Wesley, Reading, Massachusetts. This is copyright 1997. And then for biographical information on Carbutt, believe it or not, he's had a biography written. John Carbutt on the Frontiers of Photography by William Bray, B-R-E-Y. This is Willowdale Press, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, copyright 1984. Okay, until I see you again, stay safe, stay well. I hope to see you at the cemetery.